And now it's my pleasure to introduce two speakers who will be here together. Nikolai hostrop lankier who is a sustainability engineer at CF Muller Architects, and he's a specialist in, in indoor climate, daylight, energy, and life cycle analysis. And he's accompanied by Löwe Berger Viveg, a simulation engineer who works at Canozi Architects. And Löwe uh, is a specialist in thermal building physics energy and daylight simulation. They're going to talk about predicting daylight on a larger scale, on the urban scale. Welcome. Yeah, so hello to everyone and good afternoon. Uh, we're very happy to be here at the Velux Daylight Symposium stage and we're here to present how we apply research into practice uh, to evaluate urban daylight on a large scale and add value in the early design phase. Today uh, we'll try to outline the problems driving this research, um, share our methods for solving part of the problem uh, and show how we apply it in practice. Well, who are we then? Uh, we are one Swede and one Dane, and we work as uh, engineers and focus on sustainability and building performance uh, simulation, and uh, especially focusing on how we apply research into practice to generate value. So this project started as a research project uh, at DTU during our studies, uh, combined with CF Miller Architects, and. Over time, quite a lot of people have been involved with the developing the research, as well as making it into practical tools that you can use in the design process. And of course, our research is based on a lot of other key research uh, within this field, and we aim to contribute here today by sharing our methods. And as well, a special shout out to the guys at uh, Ladybug and Honeybee, uh, whom open source simulation engines really enables this way of working with Taylor simulation in the design process that we will present today. Yes, <coughs> so jumping into what the actual problem is. So the overall issue that we're facing when we're working with building design and, and daylight is, first of all, as Franz, as, uh, Franz and uh, Mikkel also talked about, uh, cities are getting more densified and more and more regulations are getting more demanding. And with these uh, new regulations, uh, the simulation methods are also becoming more complex and requires high-level detailed 3D models and, and really complex simulation programs. So the regulation and densification issue is more political and urban development uh, discussion, so we won't go too much into that. Uh, as an engineer, the most obvious issue to dive into is this calculation method. Uh, this is where we can really improve on the problem. So during the development of a project, it's always easier and cheaper to explore the option space and change the design in the beginning of the project. Uh, what is also really important is to make changes based on qualified measurements for each design iteration that you produce. Uh, but the paradox arises when you want to qualify daylight performance in the early design phase where you have very little information about the buildings. Uh, and this is where we need new methods. So jumping into this calculation method issue, uh, we defined these four sub-issues that together forms what we call the problem scope when you're working with uh, daylight performance in the early design stage. Uh, and these four issues have to be solved uh, in order for a method or tool to work seamlessly in the early design phase. So first of all, we have this low level of information that's available. Typically, the design process starts with uh, testing a lot of different massing options uh, and already in this phase, it would be really good to have some, uh, some uh, information about the consequences for daylight. Uh, because the shape, obviously, uh, the shape of the building obviously has a big impact on the final performance of the daylight. Uh, and taking this model from a shoebox level uh, and preparing it for uh, detailed daylight simulations with, uh, with detailed windows, room depth, rooms, uh, and so on, is, is too time consuming and doesn't fit the early design stage. Um, next up is the running the actual simulation at a high enough quality is also really time consuming. Uh, and if the simulation is running locally on your PC, it probably uses a lot of CPU. 
uh, making the computer useless during the simulation uh, time. Uh, finally, we have the communication. Uh, it's really important to be able to communicate these results uh, so they can be used to inform the decisions and solve the actual issues together with the design team. Uh, and typically, we also see this as a really time-consuming activity because it requires a lot of post-production. Yeah. So we outlined uh, our research com concept trying to answer this problem scope that Nikolai has just described. And it's quite common nowadays to see these large-scale VSC analysis to predict daylight potential of urban areas. And some regions in Sweden now demand it when planning these larger urban areas. But the discrepancy between a VSC value on the facade and the end phase highly detailed uh, results is still cumbersome for even a daylight expert to interpret and even harder to communicate to non-daylight experts. So our research aims to improve the prediction capability of these facade-based results and the way you communicate them in a useful manner as design drivers. Um, and we've chosen to do this uh, by creating quite straightforward regression models as a sort of proxy between the early stage and the later stage. And uh, the regression model here is, of course, based on a reference room scenario that you test in various shading conditions while logging the data of a facade-based metric as well as the internal regulated metric. Um, the resulting regression function then works as a lookup table, basically, where you say with X amount of daylight on the facade, you should have Y amount of daylight uh, inside the room. Uh, and we set this up for sort of two tracks, uh, one for the Swedish case and one for the Danish case. Um, and uh, with uh, this uh, reference room, we could load it with standard information of reflectances from the respective countries and with wall thickness, detailed window and glazing properties. Um, and we set the room up parametrically to e easily uh, vary the facade. And in Sweden, we still use the daylight factor as the regulated metric in the building code. So it was obvious to pair that with the vertical sky components on the facade. Uh, but in the Danish case, which applies the European standard, uh, we paired solar radiation with spatial daylight autonomy. And we proposed that cumulative incident solar radiation on the facade could serve as the same early stage estimation as VSCA does for daylight factor, but for climate-based scenarios. Yeah, and using the Rhino Grasshopper parametric environment, we could vary the test room in 1,600 context scenarios and test for eight window wall ratios. So this is the uh, end phase results. And uh, these regressions, the climate-based regressions are, of course, orientationally dependent. So we generate them for the four principal directions. And then we interpolate uh, the results after 360 degrees uh, when making predictions. Uh, and the daylight factor based, of course, did not need to account for this orientation variation. And of course, there are some uh, intrinsic limitations to the accuracies of uh, these methods. Those limitations stem from uh, being able to predict scenarios that are deviate significantly from the reference room you chose, and also how well uh, these correlating metrics uh, are paired together. Uh, from our experience when testing these methods, the loss of accuracy seems to be around 10 to 30 percent compared to highly detailed analysis. And generally, the trend is that the accuracy decreases when you want to uh, test for more glazing in more shaded scenarios. In other words, when you would expect more reflecting light. And as the reduced accuracy shows, these methods need to be complemented with conventional daylight simulation. And we do that as soon as we have that information in place. But we have found when working with general mass models that the accuracy is more than good enough to identify the general problem areas of a building. And uh, what's also interesting is when we have applied this at our respective offices, I work at Canossi and Nikolai at CF Muller. Uh, we've uh, made sort of developed two different approaches to communicating the results in a useful manner. At Canossi, we focus on extrapolating the facade based results to the floor plan so that we know when planning the building and its layout uh, where we can expect the non daylit space uh, with a certain window wall ratio. At CF Muller, they've instead interpolated the results to predict an optimal glazing ratio for a set room depth. And 
we also apply this tool at different scales of building design. Uh, at this urban scale, we can evaluate large areas very quickly. This is looking at the first floor plan, the worst case floor plan. Um, and what the tool predicts is these sort of gray and dark areas. Uh, where we and they are determined by the maximum room depth that the facade from the facade that would apply with the DF medium value of one percent. So if a square room from would extend from the facade into these blobs, uh, it would uh, you could expect that its median should be one below one percent and not imply with the Swedish standard. Uh, next yeah. one. Mm. And here's an example showing it how we use it in building scale. Um, in this project, there was a desire for large common balconies, which are a great social feature, but absolutely destroys the daylight potential for some apartments. Uh, and, but by adapting the architect's first concept with using these tools uh, and having some dis clever discussions on how we could place the balconies, like concentrating the largest one uh, outside of the stairwells, removing some that were not viable, and uh, reducing the width and spreading them evenly at uh, apartments separating walls, uh, we were able to uh, s feel confident that we could solve these underlading apartments uh, without extreme amounts of glazing, and we were able to keep uh, the same amount of common balconies. And continuing with the same project, but in the floor plan scale, uh, the tool also proposes uh, a, a, a useful window wall ratio uh, to achieve these uh, daylight depths. Uh, so we found that you're under the common balconies, we would need this 30 to 40%, but to the less shaded streets, we could have be make fine with 20%. And with this information, the architect could be make the informed decision on how to uh, design the facade and where to place the non-daylight uh, uh, functions of the apartment as bathroom and hallway in this dark area. Uh, so when we do the final stage e evaluation, we see that it checked out. And although we didn't have the exact information, uh, we've made the right considerations on balconies, the placement of room functions, and glazing ratio. And this is sort of my final example. And this is where we overlay our results here in the form of the blue blob on an end phase daylight evaluation, where the goal is that every room should have 1%. And uh, this was a project that was created before we had these uh, early stage methods. Uh, and the lo its large balconies in a dense urban environment made this project very tough to solve. And the facade had to be very glazed on average 40%, but some rooms had much <coughs> more. And we can see that our tool, just running on the outline uh, of this plan and its balconies, identify quite accurately these rooms that are below 1%. Uh, and if we would have had this tool, we might, we might have sp saved all those resources that we spent trying to adapt the project in the final stage. Yes. <coughs> so at CF Miller, we use uh, Rhino as our main modeling tool in the early design phase for these uh, competition projects. Uh, so we started out by applying these regression models in a grasshopper tool. Uh, the building's facade was divided into a grid with a size similar to the standard room that we uh, got the regression models from. Uh, so you were able to browse through dif different glazing ratios and the output would then be this uh, colored grid representing the estimated spatial daylight autonomy in a standard room. But we quite quickly found out that this was not the best way to use the regression models in a facade tool. Uh, it was too difficult to interpret the, the results uh, because of the metric, spatial daylight autonomy. Uh, it didn't make much sense for non-daylight expert to use or to refer to this metric. Uh, so what we dis did was we turned the tool upside down and instead of printing spatial daylight autonomy, we made it print uh, minimum glazing ratios to comply with the spatial daylight autonomy that is in the building regulation in Denmark. Uh, this was much more valuable for, for the non-daylight experts on the design team, and they could now use the results as design drivers instead of some uh, weird metric that they didn't know about. Um, so this tool has now been implemented in our design process, and uh, when we're working with, uh, especially when we're working with uh, early stage competition projects, uh, and we use it in many different ways, uh, both to examine the glazing ratios for when we're doing uh, facade development uh, concepts, 
uh, but also when we're studying these massing iterations uh, in terms of size and placement on the side. So, and I want to highlight uh, one specific project here. It was the first I worked on at CF Müller a couple of years ago. It's a 51,000 square meter office building in the middle of Berlin uh, for the German Ministry of Environment. Uh, and in the beginning of the process, I got a lot of these uh, mass models from the architects and was asked to analyze them. Uh, and we did a lot of an analysis and many more than you see here. Uh, but we, we did it all with, with the tool to find the optimal um, daylight uh, situation. Uh, and in the end, we, we figured out uh, one that could work in both in terms of uh, the building program, solving the building program, but also in terms of daylight. <coughs> and we developed a concept that was inspired by uh, a tree crown's uh, nature uh, with, a, with a more dense uh, top than a bottom. Uh, and there is, as you can see here, there's a higher density of solar shading panels in the top of the building than in the bottom of the building. And um, this density of solar shading panels was informed by using the tool. Uh, and the proposal won the architectural competition and is now in the detailed design phase. So, in the end here, uh, we would just want to reflect on the future directions for early phase uh, daylight evaluations. For this proxy model method that, that we've uh, suggested, uh, we see a potential in improving the models uh, with more complex data sets or even generating uh, new models with machine learning, a bit like uh, Franz just talked about. Um, for the direct simulation method or this floor plan uh, based uh, simulation method, uh, we could potentially see it catching a bit up uh, with the proxy model method due to the development within cloud computing and uh, GPU based uh, ray tracing. Uh, but as we also mentioned, there, was, there will always be this time-consuming activity with pre- and post-processing in the direct simulation method. So what we believe is that the proxy model method solves the issue uh, of uh, low information level and, uh, and the model preparation time. And these quick simulations that we've shown enables us to work at large scale in the early design phase. Uh, but what is also really important is this loss of accuracy that must be compensated for by doing, performing these uh, later stage analysis when you have more information about the building. Uh, the most significant key takeaway that we want to, to uh, talk about here is from our experience uh, with bringing a research project to practice is the importance of communication. Uh, and especially how communicating the results as design drivers instead of daylight metrics, how that generated a great deal of value to, to, uh, to the projects by inviting uh, the whole design team to find the best solutions possible. So thanks a lot for listening to our presentation. Uh, we hope that you enjoy what you saw and got inspired to take early stage daylight evaluations to the next level. Thank you.